Hello, so welcome. It's very bright up here and I can't see many of you, but thank you um, for having me. I'm Gillian Kelly, the District Vet at Canamble. And I'd like to welcome you to today's chat, which um, features two uh, local producers and is on the topic improving productivity with genetics, which fits in nicely after Al's talk. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Tim Bowman who in partnership with his brother Will and their families and parents run a 3,400 hectare mixed farming operation at Turawena. And this consists of a self-replacing merino flock for wool and fat lambs, a self-replacing shorthorn cattle herd and a cereal-based cropping program. The main pastures are natural grasses spread with subclovers, premier digit as a subtropical and loosen and their cattle herd consists of around 400 shorthorn cows with the aim to produce a line of steers which are versatile to many markets in a variable climate. And then I'd also like to introduce Gary Hall. So Gary and his wife Leanne, who's also here today, and their children run a beef breeding business on the western edge of the Macquarie Marshes. They run around 800 Angus breeding cows in and adjacent to the marshes. They have just under 100 hectares developed for flood irrigation that is currently sown to loosen and do a small amount of forage cropping to finish sale stock. Part of the property is Ramsar listed, which means that it's grazed under the wise use principles of the Ramsar Convention. This environmental responsibility, along with drought, water availability and a changing climate has meant that they've had to run a highly adaptive beef business. And they aim to turn off high marbling steers to the long fed feedlot market at around 420 kilos. So I think it's a widely accepted fact that Canamble is the best place in the universe. And our, our district slogan is actually from the mountains to the marshes. So I think that these two producers really do exemplify that. We've got you know Tim from Turawena and Gary from the marshes. So it is a very um, diverse um, landscape. And um, these two producers really do um, exemplify how you can run a beef business in both of those environments. So my first question is for Gary. It's, the Macquarie Marshes is really a very special place, especially to run a cattle business, but it also does present its challenges. So can you tell me how your environment influences the type of cow that you want to run? Thanks, Jill. Um, yeah, what a question. Uh, yeah, our, our environment underpins um, the kilos of beef walking up our loading ramp, and, and that's what drives our business. It, it's, like everybody knows, everybody is still in the cattle game after the, the challenges that we've had pretty much since the breaking of the millennium, millennium drought. We, we, we haven't, up until the last two years, we haven't consistently had a, had a good run of seasons. So if you're serious about uh, chasing genetic gain um, to, to lift your productivity that, that Alistair touched on, um, you've got to keep in mind the impact that you're having in, in the paddock on, on the amount, uh, available amount of food for them to raise a weaner and get back in calf. Um, how I'm doing it, I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing on genetics, but at the, at the moment, right as we speak, it, it's on fertility. We're, we're gotta get, we're gotta get our, our cows back in calf as early as we can by using short gestation and every other tool available to us. Yeah, so you focus on Tamania genetics, don't you? And um, shortening that, genet that gestation length is really important. Um, and I guess that's, ex that's essentially a breeding objective, isn't it? So um, how exactly have you shortened that gestation length up to get those cows back in calf sooner? Oh, look, when we look at breeding values across, uh, uh, across uh, like bull's eye catalogues, and, and it, uh, I, don't, I don't see any perfect bull when I go to a bull sale. It's, it's, making, it's making compromises at every angle. Um, our, our market, our, our feeder steer market, they want daily weight gain and IMF are there, uh, is what they're after. I've got to have animals that are, that are able to get back in calf and the longer, the longer the time period from when the calf hits the ground to when, when the bull mounts them is, is driven by gestation length. So as soon as we started to focus on some 
some pretty extreme, and I do stay away from extremes with our EBVs, pretty extreme short gestation bulls, all of a sudden through our AI program, we've found that, hang on, these, these heifers have got, they've got another couple of weeks to, to be able to get their body weight back up, be able to get used to having a calf sucking their guts out of them during a pretty tough late winter, early spring, uh, at the same time as for some reason evolution has decided that they lose their baby teeth and they've got their two teeth turned up. Uh, so all of that, um, there's, a, there's a real winner there. Oh, it's, some, it's just another challenge that we're faced with. As soon as we start to focus on gestation length, we've got to compromise something else. Uh, we can't, but at, at right now it's, it's, it's showing pretty good dividends to us. That's really interesting. So Tim, running a farm at Turrawena is probably a little different to the marshes, but no doubt female fertility is a profit driver in your business as well. How have you engineered your genetics program to get more of your females pregnant? Um, <clears throat> yes, a little bit different. Um, probably a little bit softer than Gary. Um, fertility is basically what we uh, mainly look at when, you know, cows. Um, start with, we join the heifers at 15 months of age. Um, that means we have to hit critical joining weights um, early. We, to start with, we used to join at two years old. Um, we pulled that back to, for ease of management rather than having two different carvings. Um, so that means, yeah, critical joining weights that we have to get the heifers up to a certain weight or close to a certain weight by a certain time. Uh, we use an AI program on the heifers which um, starts a week earlier than our normal joining period. Um, this gives the heifers an extra week, um, but also gives them more time because when you're AIing, we find 60% or 70% of the calves are actually pre day one of joining, of calving. Um, which gives just, just gives the heifers more and more time to get back into calf when they've got a calf, when they've got a, when they've got a calf um, drinking from them. Um, the other thing is we only keep two cycles. So we keep AI the heifers and keep the first cycle of a backup bull. Um, anything after that gets culled. So basically they're only going to join, they're only going to calve in the first three weeks of joining. Anything after that we say we're happy to get rid of to keep the most fertile females in our herd. Um, we preg test cows on a six week joining. That has um, pushed out to nine and 12 this year because we're just trying to keep more cows. But when we get back to a full herd, it will be a strict six week joining. Um, and then size selection goes into that as well. Um, we don't focus on, um, like Gary, on gestation length. Given that we're probably a bit softer, we probably don't need to push that side as much because um, we believe that we can, when we get a de good spring, we've got a lot, generally got a lot of crop that cows and calves go on to, so they're reasonably in pretty good condition when they're getting a bull thrown back in with them. Um, I guess that's a really good example of how you can't really come to a field day like this or any other and take home what someone else has done and roll it out in your herd. It is really going to make a difference. This sort of enterprise you're running and setting those breeding objectives for your environment would be really important. Um, you've both mentioned AI. Um, I think a lot of people who are running a commercial enterprise, particularly one at scale, might be daunted by that, but it seems to work for you guys. Um, can you sort of tell me what that involves? Maybe, Tim, if you go first. Yep. Um, so to start with, we'll cull 10 to 15% of the heifer group. Um, basically, we will cull on weight and structure, um, but try and leave as many heifers in as possible just so we are going back to fertility. I'd, we would prefer to have a lower end heifer that gets into calf every year rather than having a beautiful looking heifer that falls out the first year. That's costing you money. Whereas if you've got a heifer getting, is 10 years old and has produced your calf every year, she's making a lot of money for you. Uh, we work on a fixed time with heat detection AI program that's been developed by, by Gary Wilkinson. Um, so basically the heifers come in, 
get a few injections, a cedar, um, and then day 10 or 11, when we pull the cedars out, we put a heat pad on, um, and then we'll watch them after that to work. When they come on heat, tells us when they need to be AI'd over a 24 to 36 hour period. So we go and watch them, pull them into the yards, and when that heat pad's going off, I think it's 12 hours after heat detection. Um, and we'll, we're probably a bit lucky, we've got a, I've got a brother that's a vet, and he comes and does the actual ai -ing. So he's happy to stay around for a day and a half, two days, AI-ing when they really should be AI'd, um, which I think is quite beneficial. Talking to Gary, a lot of uh, Victorian producers don't use heat detection, or talking to, and our stub producers are saying, got the same opinion that down south is probably easier to get cows or heifers into, AI, into calf through AI, but where it's a bit tighter, us or any further north, they find heat detection is very important to getting the right time of that AI process. Very good. And Gary, you're a bit more extensive. Um, how does it work for you, the AI program? Yeah, I can't imagine, could never even imagine having this conversation, Gillian. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know why we've taken it on. A genetic gain is our ultimate goal. Um, we're, we're in a desperate hurry to, 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 get, to get improvement into our cattle. So uh, let's say last year, for example, we did, like Tim, fixed on AI program. Um, I think we did 200 heifers. Uh, same deal, run through the yards two times to, to needle and put the cedars in, pull the cedars. Unlike Tim, we, we inseminate all our cows in one day. We're using a... Um, AI technician from Southern Victoria, he's factored us into his program, rain, hail or shine, we've got to inseminate the cows at nine o'clock on, often it's around 1st of October for us. Um, seasonal variations during that period are great, over the extended period we've been doing it, uh, we go for anything from having two jumpers on standing up beside the crush to, to having a swarm swarm of black flies and, 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 and dust storm on the horizon. So, um, look, the reality is for, for our, our program, 50% of the heifers is, is acceptable. Um, I'd love it to be higher because they're our best genetics. This year we actually took on a, on a um, second round and did, did heat detection. Um, I'm not too sure if we'll be doing that again. Unlike Tim, we don't have a brother as a vet. We called <laughs> on, a, on a local, local vet. But uh, I, I, I just love AI, and, and I suppose one thing we should mention is is a higher conception rate in uh, mature cows, uh, and that's that's what's fun. My my cattle manager, my wife, doesn't approve of running the running the calves, freshly mostly freshly branded young calves back through the yard to be part of the program. Um, it is difficult. We've only got to drop a couple, miss mother a couple, mm -hmm. and the whole thing's questionable. But as far as as far as cracking good calves on the ground, uh, higher conception rates, I'd encourage anybody to have a go at that at that mature older cows in the AI program. Great. So I think, as as Al alluded to, ultimately every you know every beef producer gets paid for kilos of beef out the loading ramp. Um, Tim, you've worked really hard to improve your growth rates and turn your steers off earlier. Can you tell me more about that? Because that's really exciting. Yep. Um, so probably go back 10 years ago, we would sell our steers, same weight, 450, 500 kilos, going into a feedlot at probably 15 months to eight in a good year and 18 months in an average or older in an average year. Um, we're push, trying to push that as much as far forward as possible. So basically the last two, well, last two years been good, have been 12 months, 12 months they've started going um, at the top 500 kilos. I think some of the top last year might have been 530 or 40 kilos at a pretty close to 12 months of age. Um, how we've got there is basically bull selection. Um, we're chasing firstly a low, low birth weight bull to to make sure we're getting a calf on the ground. But then I wouldn't say high growth rates, but average to above average. We, we don't chase the extreme, extremely high growth rates because we think that's um, 
that tends to lead to a bigger cow, which we don't always want. Bigger cows are also harder to feed. Um, we want a moderate cow that's going to produce a calf that's going to grow quickly. Um, so basically, yeah. But the other thing in, uh, in producing steers for us is, and the program with, that we go into is that we want high quality calves. So what we really focus on probably more than anything is marbling and eye muscle area and fats. Um, we're chasing the high quality um, carcasses is at the end of it, so there's, that's what we're really looking for. And Gary, it's the same for you. What what EBV data th and things like that are you looking for and targeting as a priority to get growth in your system? Everything. Trying to find to balance it. <laughs> it's difficult. Um, like net feed efficiency. Well, like yeah, I, uh, birth weight, all all of the above. Uh, try and avoid the extremes. Nothing for free in breeding cattle. Like those those plus one fifty. 600 days, like no, I'd love, I'd love to bring them home, but we don't. Um, probably the one thing we we, we didn't touch on, and, and when when Lee and I are selecting um, sires to use, it's pretty much we're just given a, a group of sires. So so part of the program we're in, we don't have the luxury of attending a bull sale and purchasing the bull. Um, we uh, some years ago we opted to be part of the Team Tamania where our, our, we lease our bulls and the decision is made for us of which bulls we use. We do have a have um, a pretty big say on what size we use in the AI program, given a choice, um, given a choice of what size to use. But um, whatever, whatever group of, of um, bull figures I'm looking at, it's so important we have a high accuracy. I, I'm not interested in bulls that, that don't have high accuracy, especially especially carcass traits. We can't physically tell uh, what what's going on under their skin. But yeah, that's a really important point, isn't it? That accuracy, and I know that's something that you're working um, working on into the future too, um, in terms of gathering more data to get that accuracy. Um, and that's really important industry wide. So. Following on about every, how everybody does love data, so yeah, we're saying data a lot again, Kelly. Um, you chase it right through the supply chain. So Gary, can you tell me about the value of that to your business and the feedback that you get and, um, and yeah, chasing that right through the supply chain? Yeah, so the feedback data, everybody knows it's difficult to collect. Whoever's been breeding feeder steers for an extended period of time, uh, pretty aware of the challenges of getting get feedback data from the feedlots. Uh, I've, for the first time, about a month ago, I received I received our 2019 drop um, last load of steers feedback without hassling that particular, that, that's the first time. Every other time it's push, 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 push to get it. That, that, and do you think that was just a squeaky wheel or do you think that's an industry change that they're now more forthcoming with it? I'd like to think, look, the reality is that it's market intelligence. If, if they know where we are, where we are um, they're, they're, they're trying to keep it a secret. Um, I don't know if there's many people in the room from the feedlot sector, but um, we, we need to know. We need to know we're on the right direction. We need to know the decisions we're making is satisfying our customers. Um, beef's an interesting product when you're a beef, serious beef producer. You can't use it for anything else other than eating. I don't know, they do a lot of different things with it, but you don't paint the walls with it or you don't pave the road with it. Beef, the ultimate end product of beef is human consumption. So if, if we're focusing and pushing hard to, to keep our, our market, uh, we need that feedback, absolutely critical. It's the same with the MSA grading when, we, when we're killing cows. I still struggle a little bit with our gas rage cows and MSA grading, but that's just a personal challenge, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of others here today that'll share that share, share that issue. But um, that data, to me, and, and where we're headed is so critical. Great. Um, so, Tim, I know you're chasing data as well. Um, how are you doing that? And then what do you do with that data? How does it come back into your business to create change? Or does it just reassure you that you're on the right track? Um, 
we've probably found it easier to get back get data back the last couple of years. Um, given the thousand guineas short horn program, they've actually been more for forth giving with data. Um, whether that's the short horn society pushing that or um, the Cats family at Futurity Shorthorns, where we buy bulls, um, we we are getting starting to get data back easier than we used to. Um, Dad's been producing steers that go into JPS for 30 or 40 years, and he has data from 30 years ago. And I'm quite sure JBS have all that data. Um, and I don't know why, as Gary said, why they don't give it out to everyone to, say, to show where people are sitting um, within their own herd and, and benchmark against all the other herds. Um, if, you have, if you know where you're sitting, you can then know where you need to go. Um, so we get basic data of weight gains, um, carcass data, and that all fee, the reason we, part of the reason we started this was because um, to give feedback to the stud producer so he can get actual data back on his bulls. Um, he's producing bulls that are never killed in their life, but well, n never killed in a prime example. Um, so basically he wants steers running through the feedlots, running through abattoirs so he can tell he can get actual data back that then feeds back to EBVs, EPDs, whatever, whichever one you whichever breed you sit within. Um, that then go back into the his bulls so then those bulls can be ranked accurately. Basically to increase accuracy as Gary said. Um, so we we give that data back to them um, and we, we use that data to get a bit of a, a guide of how our bulls are going as a herd, but then also how the overall average herd is going um, and how what we're, whether what we're producing is fitting, fitting in the Thousand Guineas program and um, coming out the other end as prime beef, really. Um, right. So, I mean, I know that Gary, in particular, you're taking that data, gathering an analysis, even back to the farm level, and are considering moving away from classing animals visually and using data more even to class animals on farm. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, we're like it's a pretty poor time right now, as we're herd all, rebuilding. All, all, all yeah, the all, all post drought, um, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we're not going to give up visual altogether. Still play a role, but we're going to um, have a look at heifer select to go through and um, understand uh, the uh, genetics, genomics of our um, young to join females. At, at times, we've we've set the bar as high as 50% classing, um, depending on on the numbers we've got to play with. So uh, it'll be just another tool um, and. Just the other day, we had five new loose bulls turn up. Uh, Leanne went down the yard, and it's 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 very difficult to pick out what what's what's under their skin. Like we can all put pick the little heifer bull, and we can all pick the big cow killer, but it's those is those high high marbling, um, like high growthy cattle that are that are hidden under the skin that we want to know more about. So we'll be definitely. Uh, entering the world of, of um, genomics pretty soon, as soon as our numbers can get around us. Great. So one final question to both of you before we open it up for audience questions. Um, what does the genomic future of your herd and the industry look like? Where do you think we're going? What, what would you like to see next? I'll let you decide who answers first. I don't know. Um, Multi-breed EBVs, I'm just excited about that. I, I don't, there's a fair bit of it I don't understand, but there's a few breeds we can get some IMF out of Wagyu and we can get some survivability out of, out of the, uh, out of the um, Herefords. We could have, have some of Tim's short on growth rates, 500 plus kilos at 12 months. Like, yeah, we can do so much and still be Angus cattle. Like I, I just see, I don't quite understand how it's going to happen, but this multi-breed EBV is something that um, I can see is going to change, as well as uh, using tools like Heifer Select. Great. Uh, 
I think accuracy is one of the biggest things that we need to improve, as Gary said earlier, um, whether that's through genomic testing and getting a DNA structure on all the cattle and actually improving that so it's um, a lot more accurate, I think will help. Um, we have genomic tested and de well, DNA tested some steers. And in discussions with the Jason Cats, we've found that it's, there's probably still a few teething issues in that at that state at the moment. So I think, um, yeah, DNA testing and actually getting that to a point where it's um, quite accurate to be able to DNA test 12 month old heifers and say, well, these, you're gonna, these are your bottom 10, 15 percent. They're gone at a prime age rather than holding them on. And three years down the track, they've lost a calf. They're not worth as much. Um, I think, yeah, that's going to be make everyone more efficient if we know exactly, we'll have a fair idea of where where all our cows are sitting at a young age. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to watching it happen. Um, I've just got some final slides, which are some take home messages for Tim and then for Gary. Did you want to um, sum up anything, Tim, or um, add anything that you'd also like the audience to know? I think they're pretty important take home messages though. I think your wise words were, the quickest way from point A to B is a straight line, but you've got to know where point A is. So yeah, knowing where you're sitting to start with is super important. Honestly, I wrote those take home messages probably six months ago, so I'm right. probably not even sure what they are. <laughs> they're um, really important. <laughs> Great, well, we might open it. Well, Gary, have you got anything to add with those take home messages? And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, look, the link link with our production system with a healthy, sustainable environment is probably is is what we're about. Um, I, I just like we've got a climate change on the horizon. We've got some real challenges fa facing agriculture that's out of our control. Um, it, while we will focus on um, methane emission and earlier slaughter rates, uh, as an industry, um, some of the work that's being done that MLA are a part of with, with um, emission uh, is worth watching, but I, I just can't, I can't influence that directly um, other than pushing my genetic gain uh, to, to lift my production. Great. Thank you. So we might now open it up for audience questions, if there's time. Beauty. I think there's time. I've lost track. <laughs> thank you, Gillian, and thank you, Gary and Tim. Gillian, now very um, well thought out and planned questions, which was great. We'll now ask Al back on stage, and I'm seeking questions from the audience. We'll have a couple of microphones. We'll have to give the microphones back, fellas. I know you've grown a bit attached to them, but there we go. <coughs> and we're seeking questions from the audience, and I'm just giving you the heads up. We're after questions and not statements. If you proceed to make a statement, I will be coming to get your name and phone number so you can go on the speaker list for the Wagga Red Meat update in August. Okay, fire away. Uh, David Harbison, question for Tim. You commented on your extending your joining either this year or just the last couple, I'm not sure, just for to nine to 12 weeks. I'm intrigued how long term that can help your fertility system when those calves or those cows now calve late and the chance of them going back in calf is obviously then decreased significantly. So those cows next year, if they don't get with him back within six weeks, they'll be culled. Um, the only reason we're keeping them is we looked at selling them, practicing in calf for that six to 12 week period um, and buying something in, um, but buying some, we found that buying something in at this point in time is probably pretty difficult. Um, and calves, cows that we have bred and produced on farm are probably going to um, cope better to our system rather than bringing something in anyway. Um, so yeah, basically anything six to 12 weeks has gone into a cull mob. Um, and if they don't push back forward into the six weeks, they're gonna go, which is probably where, what's gonna happen. It's just a matter of, we've we're going, gone from 320 calves within the six weeks, and we're gonna have close to 380 in the 12 weeks just to get those extra 60 calves on ground, we thought it was, um, while we've got 
the surplus feed, it was eat better to keep them rather than send them off and um, have extra feed growing around. Yep. Uh, Tim Carroll, it's a question for both. Um, primarily, I'll start with Gary. The something you haven't touched on is weaning weights or weaning ages. Um, so we've talked a lot about getting a cow back in calf, but you haven't talked about when you might pull that calf off. And I get that seasons dictate that a lot. Um, the second part of that question, though, more so for Tim after this one, Gary, is average daily gains on your calves and whether you're looking at those types of things in terms of genetics. I'll have a go at weaning age and weight. In, in our landscape, it's variable. Our calves are still on our, on our cows. We're having that discussion right now. Available, our feed budgeting, available, available feed, and a window of opportunity to pull them off. Uh, we, have, we have a serious problem with pink eye. If we, if we ha happen to wean at the wrong, at the wrong time, um, we get hot, hot weather in February, March. Uh, it has been a useful drought management tool to wean down to 100 days. Um, I, I, we've probably had to do that through 17, 18, and 19, and 20, and and we're we're just standing back and reevaluating uh, early winning. Definitely, definitely part of our our drought strategy. But um, as far as reconception, uh, conception and and um, joining weights for those for those heifers, uh, yeah. Oh, look, I, I don't I don't pull heifers out because they haven't wet, reached optimum weight. Uh, we'll, we'll give them the opportunity, but just at the moment, with a couple of good seasons, we've been achieving it, no problem. Um, depends on season, basically. Uh, during the drought, we weaned, I think, about four months of age, and they ranged from 120 to 180 kilos and went straight on to um, pellets or a ration, a full ration basically. Um, we found that was better than feeding, I think we worked out the cows needed 15 or 20 kilos of hay or grain a day compared to if you split them up, they probably only need 12 or 15. Um, so that's what we did during the drought. We did wean pretty early. At the moment, we generally wean about six months of age and they range from 180 kilos to 300 and 20 kilos, I think they were this year. Um, it's it's probably not really a weight for us. It's more of a timing. Um, same with Gary. If we do it at the wrong time, we can end up with a lot of pink eye issues. Um, for joining, we join September, October. Um, if if we're getting a bit dry, we'd prefer to feed the cows rather than pull the calves off just to just for a joining period, basically. Um, we'll, we're happy to feed them hay. Um, and the same with the calves. If we wean them and the feed's not there, we're happy to throw loose and hay out at them. Um, calves at the moment, we've got a heap of feed around, they're on digit. Um, but we're giving them loose and hay just to give them that bit extra protein, just to keep them going. Well, sorry, what was the second part of that? Uh, we measure on daily average daily gains, so we we probably don't use uh, the data as well as we should. But at the problem that we're finding at the moment is when we're still um, increasing our herd numbers, why cull a cow even if she's producing you a lower quality calf? Um, I do know of probably at the bottom 10% of cows probably producing the bottom 10% of calves every year um, for the four or five years that we've been um, weighing the steers. And one, when we get to a point that we have enough cows, they'll be the first ones to go. Um, whether they're a two-year-old heifer or a five-year-old cow, it's not doesn't matter. When we get enough data to show that they're not performing, they'll be, they'll be going. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Okay, one there and then one here. Yep. Uh, Callan Thompson, LLS. Um, Al, my question's for you. Um, 
we're going through a restocking phase and there's been a lot of um, cattle bought off auctions plus that might not be what producers actually want on farm, but at the moment it's, it's hooves on the ground. In your opinion, what's our fastest track back to good genetics? I'd like to um, I'd like to step slightly to the one side and disappear after that one, Cal. Thank you. I don't know how to answer that. I think look, we get really hung up on genetics sometimes. Like genetics are important and and they are the way of building long term productivity into a herd. But genetics are a tool that we should be be using and using appropriately. And I guess that that. If you don't know what you want your business to achieve, then it's then that's a difficult. That's got to be the starting point. So for people looking to rebuild, what are they actually trying to do? If they're trying to rebuild a business, they're getting paid on kilograms of red meat, and as Gary said, like we can only use it to eat. So I guess that what I want people to do is not fixate on a breed or a genetics necessarily to start with, but to work out where is it in their in their system that they are the most profitable and the most sustainable and achieving that, that balance of life and, and enterprise success that they need. Now, if they can do that with a crossbred program that's looking at turning over cattle very quickly or a trading program, buying those good quality Brahmin cattle out of the north that you can hear making money from here, not that I'm giving away a bias or anything, but, you know, those cattle, it's not about the fact that they've got plenty of skin and plenty of ear. It's the fact that they will grow like steam for us and we will get paid on kilos of beef. It's about, it is about the product that we're trying to achieve, which is red meat. Now, that is, I think, just as efficient as someone who's looking at long-term genetic improvement. But you can't compare that to someone, um, say, like Gary, who's got a very good focus on, on a program that has some very specific parameters. So he's going to have to have a different set of, of discussions about his genetic improvement based around some very clearly defined models. So your, your question really has to come back down to, we are looking to rebuild after four years of horrendous drought. What have we learned out of that in terms of survival for our business and for our family? And it is how much money we need to make to keep our business going to achieve our outcomes. Now, can you do that more efficiently trading cattle and just putting kilos of beef on by using your pastures better? And why complicate it, make it more difficult than that? You, you won't get on the front page of the land because you bought a $100,000 bull, but you'll have your two weeks at Yamba and your kids will be at a good school and you pay your bills. I know which way I'd, I'd encourage my clients to go. So I don't know that I've quite answered your question, but I tend to take it back to, we have to really have a focus on what are we trying to achieve? And if we don't know that, to be like that starting point, you know, where is point A? Thanks, Al. Now down the front here. Yep, oh, hi, question for everyone really, but probably more specifically Gary. Um, the Heifer Select program you, was, you mentioned, um, conducted by Angus Australia, um, can you in, um, elaborate on, on criteria uh, and, and, and more, de more detail on you know, how that actually works, please? We wish I could, we haven't done it yet. Um, but just the broad principles as that I understand, um, because the Angus breed has, has uh, a lot of animals in their database. So we take a DNA hair sample from, from each of our heifers. Uh, it's critical to have the identification linked to the, to the DNA sample. Um, and then, and then that, that sh shot off and we were able to set the parameters uh, of what, what we're gonna keep in and what we're gonna keep out. So it's just another tool for us to use when we're selecting our heifers. I'm right at the moment, there's some bloody cracking Angus heifers on auction plus, and I'm sure it's the same with other breeds. And are they wolf in sheep's clothing? Like, we don't know. Other people are already doing this. Um, and I'm, I'm growing, growing nervousness at getting out there, entering the market into some cracking Angus heifers, and they might have been the ones that somebody else has already thrown out. So the industry's right on a pinnacle of 
like, just imagine a livestock agent trying to trying to use that as a marketing tool that these are his, that the, these fit into this select criteria um, that that he's that his client has selected. Um, um, we're going to learn about it and we're going to learn real quick and the only way we learn is by jumping in and doing it. So that doesn't um, address any structural, um, you know, visual... Um, well, 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 it'd be linked into the structural scoring, but that's, that's our job. Um, we, 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 had, we had a great conversation at, over dinner last night about the role that visual assessment is going to continue to play as, as we enter this, this new world of of genomics and the available information that we're all going to be presented with us. Um, I, I'm actually married to a pretty amazing girl that is real good at telling me if we can't keep that one, it's got a crook leg or or its head's not set right. Or so that'll be that'll be the challenge. We'll be faced with a yard full of cattle that are that are, uh, their genomics is is sound. We want to keep, but there'll be flaws in them. So we'll have to once again make the decision on which ones we keep, which ones we throw out. Thank you. I'm just going to throw my genetics editor hat on for a second. So the important thing to think about genomic testing is that we're taking a DNA sample. The, the value of, of, of that is lining that up against the reference population of the breed. So if we have a very small reference population, just because that animal might be a trait leader in certain production traits doesn't necessarily mean that they're an outstanding animal. So that's the first thing. But in the Angus world, because I have such a vast reference population, what that means is that you can set your parameters. Now, where it gets tricky is that if I choose, my heifers might be totally designed around a New England breeding program. So the traits and the emphasis I place on those traits will be different to what Gary needs for his environment and his market access. So what we get from that DNA is the ability to class up our animals for their genetic superiority based on the traits that matter for us. And those heifers might all look the same, but we'll have that ranking within them, but they'll be different to my heifers, which will be ranked differently based on the weightings I want on those traits. What you have out of that then is, if you like, a pool of genetically ranked animals. You still have to go in and go, well, that one's cranky, that one's got three legs, that one's got claw toes, and that one's just black. And then you can decide what you want to do from there. So genomics and genomic selection is just the, the, the tool that we have to take to make that decision, refine our decision process down to make it a bit easier for us in, in the next phase. Sorry, Kim. Last question. Did you want to ask one down here? Yeah, just a really quick question oh, for Gary sorry, and no. Alistair. I, um, no. Sorry, I'll be super quick. Um, when you speak about um, selecting for a shorter gestation length, are there is there a direct correlation between other traits that you compromise on when you are specifically choosing for the shorter gestation? Yes. You said want to be quick. Yes, everything's a compromise for me. Um, I'm just trying to think what it is. Gestation length, mostly linked to growth rate, I'd imagine. 600 day mature cow weight, like all of that. Um, you don't get anything for free. That's that's my experience. Yep. Sorry, I know Kel's gonna kill me. So there's a couple of mature cow weight, and we know that Angus cows have increased by two kilos a year for the last 20 years. So Angus cows are now 40 kilos heavier than they were in 20, whatever it is, 20 or 2000. So they're heavier. So mature cow weight plays into that. Days to calving. How many people look at days to calving index? Yeah. Okay, so days to calving as well as, as gestation length, they also help. One final very quick one from a very patient question asker up the back. Uh, thank you. This is a very general question, so anyone can answer it. Uh, the industry is set up so we get paid by the kilo. Um, so producers have been focusing on size and growth weight growth rate. Is that going to come back and bite us at some stage? This has sort of been touched on already. Um, and is there some better structure that we could get paid for that doesn't encourage too much mature cow weight? Gillian, it's your turn. <laughs> um, we couldn't quickly decide who'd take that, so I'll take that hospital pass. But. Um, we are producing a, a, an amount 
Now, it's the quality that, that we're really focusing on. So if you listen to potentially what Sarah said today and showed you the national MSA index at the moment is 57.62. If you are selling cattle direct to a number of works now, there is a, you know, the grid is refined further, not just on the kilos that you produce, but on your ability to meet or exceed an index. So I don't think we're ever going to get away from kilos of beef produced and being paid on kilos of, of, of red meat, but I think our payments will be refined or enhanced by, um, by the quality. The other thing that I, I probably would like to point out, and we talked about this last night, is that sometimes payment is a little bit more subtle than just the obvious getting a kilo um, uh, price or a discount. It is sometimes access and access to pens into a feed yard or access into a box. And that's possibly going to be maybe the way that some of our payments are going to be further refined into the future. So I don't know that that quite answers your question, but I think there'll be more subtleties introduced beyond the just kilos of, of beef price. Thanks everyone for some great questions and, um, and some things to make us all think later in the day. Uh, would you all like to join with me in thanking our amazing speakers? And now, could you all quietly and quickly make your way back to the main auditorium where you're going to learn about how much data you need to collect on your feed base? Thank you. Yeah, heaps.